The new let function enables you to declare variables and intermediate calculations inside of a formula. It's like the dax var function or let inside a Power Query. And if you're familiar with Power Pivot, Power Query or programming, you'll understand these terms. But don't be put off. Let is a dead easy function to learn and it improves the readability and performance of your formulas. Now let is currently in beta for Office 365 users on the Insiders channel, so you may not have it yet, but it's an exciting new function, so I wanted to share it with you. The let function syntax is straightforward, consisting of name and value pairs, and then a calculation. If we take an easy example, let's say our first variable's name is x, and x's value is 5. We can continue to add more name and value pairs as we need. So we'll give our second variable name y, and y's value is 10. And then we can finish with a calculation, x plus y. And as I type in the variable names, you can see they appear in the IntelliSense, so I can simply tab to select that. Close parentheses and press Enter, and you can see my let formula returns 15. The key here is that you can add more name and value pairs. So I've got one, two, as you need, but you will always have an odd number of arguments because you've got this final calculation. Now the value arguments in this example are numbers. We've got five and 10, but you can also use text or formulas or expressions, arrays, cell references, Boolean values, or defined names. Let's take a look at another example. One of the main reasons for using let is to improve calculation efficiency. Often, we'll reuse the same calculation inside of a single formula. We used to see this regularly when handling errors returned by VLOOKUP. However, the if error function introduced in Excel 2007 solved that. But if you ever find yourself repeating a calculation inside of a formula, you know it's time to use let. For example, here I want to calculate a forecast for sales for the next period. I've got a simple rule where if the total sales are greater than 100, then I'll expect a 5% increase. But if total sales are less than 100, I'll expect a 3% decrease. So in this if formula, you can see Excel is performing the same sum one, two, three times. In actual fact, it'll only perform it twice, once for the logical test, and then that logical test will either result in a value that's true or a value that's false. So one of these will be calculated, but that's double the work for Excel. So with let, we can halve the work Excel has to do. Let's take a look. First, I'm going to declare a name for the sales. Now I like to build my let formulas up in the formula bar. The first thing we're going to do is press Alt and Enter to start a new line in the formula. It's just going to make it clearer for when you're building the formula as well as when you read it back later. And we're going to use one line for each name and value pair. So the first name is sales current year or CY for short. And this is simply the sum of these values here, close parentheses, comma, alt enter to go to the next line. Here's where I'm going to do my final calculation. So if sales current year and you can see it's popped up in the IntelliSense I'm just going to tab to enter it. it saves me typing the whole thing if they're greater than 100 then sales current year times 1.05 otherwise sales current year times 0.97 close my if close let and press enter now with this formula Excel only calculates the sum once and then it reuses it here and or here and here and while the formula is slightly longer than the if formula, it's twice as efficient. So if you ever reuse an expression inside of a formula, that's when you know it's time to use let. Now obviously in an example like this, the efficiency gain is immaterial, but if you can imagine having this type of formula over thousands of rows, it's going to start to make a difference. Now here I have a table of data and I want to be able to toggle between different types of aggregations, whether it's total or sum, minimum, maximum, or average. Now, I actually created this example back in 2016, and I'm updating it here to use with the let function. The form control buttons 
output to cell F6. So as I select a different button, it returns the number of the selected button. I'm going to use the subtotal function to aggregate the data. You could also use the aggregate function if you prefer, but I'm going to stick with subtotal. Now I can see the first argument in subtotal allows me to specify the aggregation method, but I need to convert the value returned by the radio button here to the aggregation type numbers in the subtotal function. We can see the numbers are 1 for average, 4 for max, 5 for min, and 9 for sum. So I need to convert 1, 2, 3, and 4 to their respective numbers. And I'm going to use the choose function for this. Equally, I could use the switch function. So choose requires an index number, and I'm going to use this cell here for that, which is the output of my radio button. So with the first radio button selected, it returns number 1. And 1 is total, which should be number 9 in my subtotal list. So 1 is 9. 2 is min, that's number 5 for subtotal. 3 will be max, that's number 4 for subtotal. And average is number 4, which is number 1 for subtotal. So close parentheses, and you can see at the moment it's returning 9, which is the sum. As I select a different radio button, it returns the relevant number for subtotal. So that's how we're going to use choose. I'm just going to delete that because we don't need it there. I just wanted to explain how it works. I'll get started with let. Again, let's pop up here to the formula bar, Alt Enter to go to the next line. So I'm going to specify my range. It's going to be these cells here, Alt Enter. Then I want to name the cell that contains the selection in the radio button. So I'm going to call that select and that's this cell here. Alt Enter. Now I'm ready to use choose to convert the radio button number to the subtotal aggregation type. So I'm going to call it ag and we need choose. And here I'll use a previously declared name for the index number and that's select. And notice again it appears in the IntelliSense so I can just tab to enter it. The next argument will be the numbers. So remember 1 is total so that's 9 then min is 5, max is 4, and average is 1. Close, choose, comma, alt, enter. Lastly, I just enter the subtotal formula, which asks for the function number. Well, remember we've declared that up here with ag, so I can just copy and paste that in if I like. Comma, what's the reference? Well, that's the range we declared earlier. Close subtotal, close let, and press enter. Now when I choose a different radio button, you can see my formula automatically updates. Now as a finishing touch, it would be nice to add a dynamic label using choose. So again, we're going to reference this cell here. And all I need to do is type in the different text that I want returned, depending on the radio button selected. So minimum, maximum, and average close parentheses, and I'll append this to some more text so that it has a nice label that explains exactly what's being displayed in the cell. When you use relative references in a let formula, you can copy it to other cells and have it automatically update just like any other formula. For example, here I want to summarize the data in this table by brand and month. I can use a SUMIFS formula for this, but let will make the formula easier to understand. Now notice that the dates in row 3 are proper date serial numbers, and they represent the first of each month. I've simply formatted the font to only show me the month and year. Now I'll start by entering my let, Alt Enter to move down to the next row. So first of all, I need to declare the month start. So we'll call that month start. And it's this cell here. Now I need to F4 to absolute the row number because when I copy it down, I want it to stay fixed on this row for the month. But when I copy it across, I want it to update to each month respectively. So that's month start. I also need my month end. And I can calculate that with the end of month function. Again, referencing this cell here, remember it contains the first of the month. So I want the last date of the current month. So I only want to move forward zero months, i.e. the current month, comma, 
Alt Enter to the next row. Here I'll give my brand cell a name. So that's this cell here, but I want the column reference absolute this time so that when I copy it across, it stays anchored to column F, comma, Alt Enter. So now that I have my criteria declared, I'll use the filter function to return the data for January for brand A data. I'm going to call this brand range. And like I said, we're using filter. So what array are we filtering? Well, I want to return the sales values. So we're going to filter the sales column of table one, comma. Now the next argument for filter must evaluate to an array of Boolean true and false values. I have three criteria, so I'm going to wrap each one in parentheses and then I'll multiply them by one another because they're AND criteria. So the first one is to check that the brand matches the brand declared in cell F4, which I've named brand. Close my parentheses, multiply by the next criteria, which is to check that the date is greater than or equal to the month start. Close parentheses, multiply by checking that the date is also less than or equal to the month end. Close parentheses. So the multiplication sign will treat all of these criteria as AND criteria. So filter the sales where the brand equals the brand in cell F4 and the date cell is greater than or equal to the month start and the date cell is less than or equal to the month end. So that is the filter range. Close my parentheses on filter, comma, Alt Enter. Now all I need to do is sum the brand range. Close sum, close let, press enter. So if we look at the formula, in one cell I can understand everything that's going on. I can see what cell the month start is in. I can see how the month end is calculated. I can see the cell the brand is in and so on. And I can read the formula. And this makes let a really efficient formula to work with. I don't have to go and reference another sheet or look in the name manager to see what the name represents. I can see it all in one formula. Now all I need to do is copy this formula to the remaining cells. And because I use some relative references, you can see if you look in the formula bar as I move through the cells that those relative references update accordingly. Now one thing I do want to point out here is when you work with table structured references like this, it's really important that you copy and paste the cells as opposed to using left click and drag to autofill. When you use left click and drag, the references become relative for the table. So if I release that, I get calc errors. And if we look at this formula, you can see it references table one sales, table one brand. As I move across, now it's referencing table one date and table one product category. And that's because it's shifted across one with each column that I dragged it to. So I'm going to control Z to undo. There are ways to make these references absolute. So you can left click and drag, but it's a bit manual and it's easier just to remember to copy and paste instead of left clicking and dragging. Now you may have already noticed that the let function can accept arrays as inputs, but it can also return arrays as outputs. For example, here I want to return a list of the top three brands and I need an array of numbers for the top three. So let's start with equals let. I'll go, again go up to the formula bar. So I need an array of numbers to rank the top three. So I'm going to call this my rank array. And we just simply type in one, two, three with semicolons and curly braces to define those values as an array. Alt enter. Now I want to specify my brand range, which is going to be this range of cells here, comma, Alt Enter, and then my sales range. Now you don't strictly have to name everything that you use in your final calculation, but it is best practice to do so. And that's why I'm doing it here. So we've got our rank array, brand range and sales range. Lastly, I just need the calculation, which is going to use index and match. So index, I want to index the brand range, matching the largest values in the sales range, returning the top three with the rank array, close parentheses on large, 
and I'm looking up, my match function needs to look up array, I'm looking up the sales range and I want an exact match, close parentheses on match, close parentheses on index and finally on let and when I press enter you'll see the results spill to the cells below because it's returned me an array of three values. So there is an example where there's an input, a value, which is an array, and an output, which returns an array. And lastly, we can use XLOOKUP to look up the brands. And notice I've selected the whole array and it's given me this array range operator. That way it will dynamically update if this array changes, but also it will spill as you'll see. So I'm looking up the brands in the brand range here and returning the sales, close parentheses, and XLOOKUP also spills. The idea of the let function is that you name your variables and then use those names in subsequent values or the final calculation step, but there's nothing forcing you to use all of the names in the let function. So looking at the let formula here, it names cell C4 as a selected brand and C5 as a selected category. And then the range is the sales column of table one that we saw earlier. And finally, it uses some ifs to return the sales value for the selected brand and category. However, instead of putting some ifs in this final calculation argument, we can declare it as a name. So let's call it calc and I'll add another comma. I also need to add a comma and now add my final argument, which is simply the name of the value that I want returned, which is my sum ifs. So I'll press enter, I get the same result because the last argument is simply returning this name. And that's an important point to remember because it enables us to troubleshoot without getting rid of this final calculation. So let's say, for example, instead of returning the calc, I wanted to check what this range name was returning. So I can simply type it in and press enter. And what happens now is it spills the results of the table one sales column to the cells below. I haven't lost my final calculation, it's still here. And when I'm happy with all my troubleshooting, I can simply replace the last name with the formula that I want returned. So you can see there, our control Z to undo, you can see there, this calc name hasn't been used in my let formula. It's sitting there, it's just dormant at the moment. So you don't have to use every name that you declare inside of your let, although it doesn't really make sense to keep names inside of let if they're not going to be used. Really, this is only useful for when you're troubleshooting. So let's put calc back and our formula is complete. I hope you're excited about the let function. Please post in the comments how you plan to use it to improve formula readability and efficiency. You can download the Excel file for this lesson from the link here. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified when I release my next video. Thanks for watching.